Hello, everybody. You're listening to Let's Master English, and my name is Coach Shane. Welcome to Let's Master English podcast number two. Now, we've got some news, transcript news. You can see the transcript to podcast one if you visit our Google Plus community, and the name of our community is Let's Master English. It's too easy. You do have to be a member of the community, so ask to join and we'll connect you. And also on this podcast, I guess my podcast one audio levels were a little bit low, so hopefully I will have made it louder this time. That way you can actually wash dishes and exercise while listening to the audio podcast. So I hope that is uh, taken care of. One more thing about the transcripts. The first transcripts were made by Jin Hong and Sergey. They are DDM members, Daily Dictation members, and they did a great job on the dictation. I'm very pleased and very proud. There were a couple of mistakes. Can you find them? Now, Jin Hong and Sergey are two very busy people. Jin Hong is, uh, I think she's a finance person in Switzerland, and Sergey is a doctor in Germany. So these people are very busy, but they were able to take some time and do the dictation. And they need your help. So if you can help out with the dictations for the podcast, that would be great news for them. You don't have to do the entire podcast you can do just a small section here or a section there. So talk with Jin Hong and Sergey on our Let's Master English community and arrange your section. See how you do. And if you make mistakes, that's okay. We're all there to help you. So, let's get it going. If you're in the Big Apple, be sure to enjoy the eats. Cronuts, street vendor hot dogs, and bagels. But a word to the wise, you'll be paying 8% more if you want your bagel sliced. City laws say that once the bread has been sliced, it's a prepared meal and must be taxed like a restaurant meal. So get your locks and schmear on the side and use a plastic knife to cut your bagel. It'll save you just over a quarter. <laughs> I guess today's news was very, very difficult. Let me read it a little bit slower. If you are in the Big Apple, be sure to enjoy the eats. Cronuts, street vendor hot dogs, and bagels. But... A word to the wise. You'll be paying 8% more if you want your bagel sliced. City laws say that once the bread has been sliced, it's a prepared meal and must be taxed like a restaurant meal. So get your locks and schmear on the side and use a plastic knife to cut your bagel. It'll save you just over a quarter. Was that any easier? Oh, I don't know. This was tough. So the story takes place in which city? Yes, that's right. Many of you know New York City. New York City has the nickname, The Big Apple. And the story is talking about what? That's right, it's talking about bagels. B-A-G-E-L-S. Bagels. Bagels are a type of bread. 
They look like a donut, but they're much heavier, and sometimes they're sweet, but many times they're not sweet. Lots of people eat them as kind of a sandwich, especially in the morning. And what's the point of this news? Well, the point of the news is to save you some money. So let's go look at the first sentence again. If you're in the Big Apple, if you are in New York City, the Big Apple. Now, why is New York City called the Big Apple? I never saw any apple trees in New York. Well, it's actually a very old history. And it refers to horse racing. So, lots of people a long time ago, they wanted to race their horses in New York City because the biggest prizes, the biggest money prizes were in New York City. Okay, do you understand? So, what does a horse like to eat? A horse likes to eat an apple. So, after a horse runs a horse race, they give it apples. Well, the big apple is the big prize, and New York City had the biggest apple, the biggest horse racing prize of all the horse races in America. So, a lot of people who were horse racers, their dream was to get to win the Big Apple. And where was the Big Apple? It was in New York City. So horse racers could say this to each other. Hey John, where are you going next week? Next week, I'm going to get the Big Apple. <gasps> You're going to New York City to win the big money prize? Yes. And because of this tradition, New York City became known as the Big Apple. So, if you're in the Big Apple, if you're in New York City, be sure to make sure you do something. Be sure to enjoy the eats, E-A-T-S. Now, this is a noun. It's not a verb. The eats means the food. But it refers to specific food in this case, in New York City. So what are the famous foods in New York City? Cronuts, street vendor hot dogs, and bagels. Now, cronuts, we studied about those in DDM. So if you are a DDM member, then you know all about cronuts. Cronuts are a combination of a croissant and a donut. It's once again a morning meal. I guess we could call it a meal. It's a type of pastry. Uh, cro uh, croissant is a pastry, a French pastry, and a donut is a deep fried piece of dough. So a cronut is a combination croissant and donut. That's very traditional New York. It was invented in New York last year and it's very popular all around the world. So that is a Big Apple eat. Another thing to eat in New York City would be street vendor hot dogs. You know what a street vendor is. People who sell things on the street. And New York City has many street vendor hot dogs. Street vendors that sell hot dogs. And they really are delicious. And another Big Apple Eat would be the bagel, B-A-G-E-L, plural, of course, bagels. Bagels are a type of bread, and it's boiled and then baked, and it's kind of hard and shiny on the outside and very chewy. Lots of people add cream cheese or jelly. They make sandwiches. Bagels are really delicious breads, and they come from Poland. But many people think 
they're a type of Jewish bread because lots of Jewish people live in New York City and they like they like bagels. But no, it's not a Jewish bread. I don't think it's actually a Polish bread. So if you're in the Big Apple, be sure to enjoy the eats. Cronuts, street vendor hot dogs, and bagels. But a word to the wise. But here is some important information, a tip to the smart people. So if you want to be a wise person, if you want to be a smart person, here is a word, a tip that you need to listen to. You'll be paying 8% more if you want your bagel sliced. So if you buy a bagel and you ask the restaurant or the bakery to cut the bagel, to slice the bagel in half, then you will have to pay 8% more. You have to pay 8% more to slice a piece of bread? Why? City laws say that once the bread has been sliced, it's a prepared meal and must be taxed like a restaurant meal. So New York City laws say that if bread is cut, then it requires a chef or a professional food service person to cut the bread, which means it's not just an over-the-counter donut, now it is a prepared meal, a meal that is prepared for you, and therefore it must be taxed like a restaurant meal. So if you buy a bagel and it's not sliced, you don't have to pay tax. But if it's sliced, you have to pay 8% tax. So, get your locks and schmear on the side and use a plastic knife to cut your bagel. So, when you buy your bagel, don't have them cut it. And get your locks and schmear on the side. Now, locks actually refers to smoked salmon. Mmm, salmon. S-A-L-M-O-N. It's a fish. And in America, smoked salmon almost always comes from Alaska. It's a very pink, actually orange meat. It's very good. That's lox. L-O-X. Lox. Smoked salmon. And schmear. S-C-H-M-E-A-R. Schmear. This is cream cheese. So many people, when they eat a bagel, they use or they put cream cheese on the top and smoke salmon. But in New York City, they say lox and schmear. In my hometown, we say smoke salmon and cream cheese. Lox and schmear are very New York words. So if you go to New York, you'll definitely see lox and schmear if you go to a traditional bagel place. So one more time. So get your lox and schmear on the side. Don't get it on the bagel, but get it on the side. Get it separately. And use a plastic knife to cut your bagel. Usually at the stores, they'll have plastic knives that you can take to spread your cheese, and also cut your bagel. If you do that, it'll save you just over a quarter. It will save you 25 cents, a little more than 25 cents. In America, a quarter is a coin, and it's the 25-cent coin. So in New York City, if you buy a fresh bagel, it's usually about $3. $3 times 8% would be $0.24, cents, but it's always a little bit more than $3, so it'll save you just over a quarter.
All right, so hopefully the story is a little bit easier to understand. Let's review some of the words and make sure you understand them. The Big Apple eats cronuts, street vendor hot dogs, bagels, a word to the wise, sliced, prepared meal, locks, schmear, on the side, a quarter. Let's listen to the story again. The first time, I'll say it nice and smooth. The second time, I'll say it like AP News. Are you ready? If you're in the Big Apple, be sure to enjoy the eats. Cronuts, street vendor hot dogs, and bagels. But a word to the wise, you'll be paying 8% more if you want your bagel sliced. City laws say that once the bread has been sliced, it's a prepared meal and must be taxed like a restaurant meal. So, get your locks and schmear on the side and use a plastic knife to cut your bagel. It'll save you just over a quarter. If you're in the Big Apple, be sure to enjoy the eats, cronuts, street vendor hot dogs, and bagels. But, a word to the wise, you'll be paying 8% more if you want your bagel sliced. City laws say that once the bread has been sliced, it's a prepared meal and must be taxed like a restaurant meal. So, get your locks and schmear on the side and use a plastic knife to cut your bagel. It'll save you just over a quarter. Okay, this is the Q&A section for Let's Master English, and we have three questions today. The first question comes from Nick Nathanson, and he wants to know the difference between active and proactive. Well, Nick, to be active means to move around a lot. So, if you are not active, you will get fat. And another example, it is important to keep your mind active, especially as you get older. So active means movement, moving around. To be proactive means to act or to move in anticipation of some future problem or some future opportunity. So for example, saving money in the bank is proactive because you might have an emergency and need the money in the future. Now, Nick, I made a big example uh, using both of the words in the same paragraph and it's about my son. So, Nick, I hope this makes it clear. My son is very active. Sometimes his activity causes him to get hurt. When he's active in the kitchen, I must be proactive. I must look for potential dangers and remove them. Ah, there's a knife in the sink. I don't want my son playing with that. I'll clean it and put it away before he finds it. So Nick, I hope that last example was clear. My son is active and I was being proactive in order to protect him so that he didn't get hurt. Okay? Our next question is from Kathy E. And she wants to know about the R sound. The R sound after TH, is it like the Spanish R. Now, when we say the Spanish R, this is kind of my expression, and I mean the riva, riva, riva. That's my Spanish R. So that 
rolling, brrr, that type of R. Many countries have this type of an R sound. So if there's a TH and then an R, is it like the Spanish R? For example, T-H-R-E-E, -E, three. T-H-R-O-W, throw. T-H-R-O-U-G-H, through. T-H-R-I-V-E, thrive. And my answer, Kathy, is no. No, it's not. The R does not touch the top of the mouth, the roof of the mouth, specifically the alveolar ridge. The tongue doesn't touch. So let's look at the number three. So T-H-R-E-E. -E. Let's just say R-E-E. -E. Re, re, re. Not re, 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 re. Not that. Re, re. And then let's add the T-H. Re, three, 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 three. So when you do the TH sound, immediately bring your tongue down. Don't let the tongue go up. Otherwise, you'll say three. Go down. Three, three. And the same with Throw, for example, throw the ball. R O W, row, row, row. Throw, 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 throw the ball. Through, T H R O U G H. Roo, 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 kangaroo, kangaroo. Through, through, through. And thrive, T H R I V E. Rive, rive, thrive, thrive. So, no, there's no rolling R. We don't say three, throw, through, thrive. It's three, throw, through, thrive. So, Kathy, keep practicing. Get that R sound down. In America, that R sound is very important. And our third question comes from Mohammed Alajmi. I hope I pronounced that right, Mohammed. Mohammed's question is, why is the D in friends silent? Friends, F-R-I-E-N-D-S. That's a great question, Muhammad, and we study this all the time in DDM. So let me give you a really short, free lesson. We have three strong sounds in American English, the S, N, and L. Those sounds are very strong, we can always hear those sounds. And we have three weak sounds in American English. The D, T, and th, the TH, the D-T-T-H. Those are very weak. Many times we can't hear them. Especially when a strong sound is next to a weak sound, the weak sound can be canceled. And that's what happens in the word friends. We have an N, D, S. The N and the S are strong sounds, and the D is a weak sound. So we can cancel the D and just say friends. Friends. Muhammad and I are friends. We're friends. I have two friends. Friends. Got it? Thanks a lot for your questions. And remember, use Coach Shane's ESL to ask your questions, and maybe I'll get it in a podcast, or maybe I'll make a video for you. I do have lots of questions to go through, so please be patient. How you doing, everybody? This is Country Shane, and I'm here to bring you the facts. The English language sometimes lies. French fries are not French, they're Belgian. And the French poodle, <laughs> it's German. And the French horn, <laughs> it's German too. French toast, how oh, French toast, it was around long before France became a country. So don't believe everything you hear in English because sometimes the English language lies. This has been Country Shane bringing you the facts.
Okay, it's time for today's Let's Master English Studying Tip. Now, today's tip is actually two parts, and the first part is know why you want to learn English. A lot of people, they start to study something, and then after a while, they give up. The reason they give up is they don't really have a passion. They don't really have a reason. It's not very necessary right now for them. So they give up. And that can be done in sports, in studying, in relationships. It happens a lot. But don't let it happen to you and your English. Think about it. Why do you want to study English? Maybe your goal is to make friends around the world. Maybe an American friend, a Canadian friend, a British friend. Maybe a friend in Egypt and you don't speak Arabic and you want to speak English. Or maybe a friend in India or Russia or Argentina, wherever. Maybe you want to study English to travel. Yeah, you can almost go anywhere in the world and speak English. They'll have English guides in every country. They have English travel books in every country. The hotels all around the world, they speak some English. So maybe it's for travel. Or maybe you love technology. You want to study. You want to study about any subject, whether it's Greek history or the pyramids in Egypt or American history or whatever, technology, all the Apple computer programming languages and everything else, technology, so much of it is in English. You need to know English to really understand technology and the sciences. Maybe that's your reason. Maybe it's so that you can watch movies and listen to songs and not have to worry about the lyrics or the subtitles. Maybe you need to master English for business or because you want to study in America. Well, this is your homework. I want you to really think about why you want to master English. What's the ultimate goal? And once you think about that goal, once you decide on what your goal is, you have to start imagining yourself being successful. You have to imagine yourself speaking English fluently, listening to a movie and a pop song and understanding everything, laughing at the humor, crying at the sad things. You have to imagine yourself in a business meeting getting a great contract, or studying in an American university, understanding what the professor is saying, and debating with other students and winning the debate. You have to pick your passion. What is it? What is your goal with English? I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you with that goal, but first you need to pick it, okay? So tell me what your goal is. You can leave a message on Coach Shane's ESL. Our podcast is there too. I want you to tell me what your goal is. What do you want to master English for? Why? Why do you want to master English? And in the next podcast, I'll give you advice on how to make friends, on how to master your English for traveling, and all the other subjects. I'll give you some advice and some tips. So this is part one. Part one, you have to have a goal, a reason, a mission. And part two, I'll help you in accomplishing that goal and that mission. That'll be in podcast three, okay? And that's it for Let's Master English Podcast 2. Thank you for joining. I hope you enjoyed it. Please share this podcast with your friends. If you want to join the podcast dictating team, then head on over to Let's Master English. That's our Google Plus community. And hey, everybody. 
Let's master English.